Hi, I'm Jim Scudder, and I'm so happy to introduce my good friend, Don Vino, as he's going to bring us a talk about the Enneagram. For many years, I've been blessed to read Don's writings. They've really helped me keep my flock warned about dangerous trends within Christianity, as well as helping us to be better witnesses to those that are hard to reach. Don has blessed our ministry by teaching as an adjunct professor at the Dayspring Bible College and Seminary. He also was a consultant for my book on evangelism, and he's been a speaker at our National Grace Conferences. Don is the co-founder and president of the Midwest Christian Outreach, which is a national apologetics ministry and mission to new religious movements based in Wonder Lake, Illinois, and they also have branch offices in Quincy, Illinois, and Cape Coral, Florida. He, along with Joy, his wonderful wife of 51 years, have been involved in discernment ministry as missionaries to new religious movements since 1987. He's a frequent guest on many radio and television broadcasts and is a staff researcher and writer for the Midwest Outreach Journal. Don is co-author of Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret, as well as the book A Matter of Basic Principles, Bill Gothard and the Christian Life. Don has contributed articles to the CRI Journal, the PFO Quarterly Journal, the Campus Life Magazine, the Journal of International Society of Christian Apologetics, the Midwest Journal of Theology, the Christian Post, and other periodicals. He's the co-host of the weekly Unknown webcast on YouTube. And today, Don will be speaking about an increasingly pervasive issue in the church, the Enneagram. As church leaders, we are to disciple people in a discerning way, anchored on the Word of God and centered in holy living. Does the Enneagram fit within scriptural faith and practice, or is it in conflict with it? Here is Don Vino with the answer. Greetings and welcome. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. And uh, we are so glad you joined us for the Enneagram, what's true, what's false, and does it matter? Today's session is uh, the Enneagram, Discipleship, and the Church. In J.C. Ryle's commentary on Matthew 15, 1 through 9, he writes this, Whenever a man takes upon him to make additions to the scriptures, he is likely to end up with valuing his own additions above scripture itself. Often favored beliefs and practices achieve the appearance of being biblical because a friend, a pastor, an elder, or even a celebrity Christian has proof texted their claim. What that means is this. They start out with an idea. They believe it's a biblical idea. They look for passages in the Bible to make it sound biblical and give it some authority. Uh, the cults often do this. False teachers outside the church do this. And unfortunately, it happens to invade the church to some degree. Some good pastors do this accidentally. Many pastors embrace teachings that others have put out because they trust the source it's coming from, uh, and they don't take the time to necessarily verify it. From time to time, newly discovered tools are offered to, that claim to assist in spiritual development. For individuals or spiritual or numerical growth of a church, the tool may or may not be helpful, but comes across as so promising and enticing uh, that uh, those who are exposed to it can't really resist. In evaluating new fads, we have to ask a series of questions, and we have run into this in the past. We had a group not that long ago, in the early 2000s, Way Down Workshop that had invaded 30,000 churches across 60 denominations, claiming to be the way God has designed to do weight loss. Weight loss is fine, but few checked out what their teachings were, and the reason was because it was regarded as, quote, a women's ministry, just a weight loss program. As it turned out, she was evangelizing the people in the church through her teachings that Jesus isn't God, the Trinity isn't true, and salvation comes only to thin people. That's a problem. Is the Bible sufficient for faith and practice, or are non-biblical or extra-biblical materials necessary, or perhaps uh, able to supercharge spiritual growth in individuals and churches? 
Are we guided by Sola Scriptura for faith and practice? Or are we trading it for something called Prima Scriptura? Prima Scriptura is scripture and other resources treated equally uh, to, or perhaps even superior to, the Bible. In the nearly 48 years since I became a Christian, I've watched a whole spectrum of church fads, personality profiles, discipleship models come and go with little to no difference in grounding or equipping believers. Some, like the shepherding movement, uh, were downright harmful in their legalism and authoritarian control. Suddenly, the idea of discipleship came this top-down, your discipler is the boss, they make your decisions for your life, your task is to find others to disciple them, you make decisions for their life, but you can't make decisions for your own life because you're not spiritually mature enough. Why is that a problem? <laughs> well, if you're mature enough to make decisions for somebody else's life, you should be mature enough to make them for your own. Uh, this had a tragic effect on certain sections of the church. Reading the Bible in its historical, grammatical context, focusing on the main plain teachings of Scripture should be central in spiritual growth. Understanding discipleship is crucial in evaluating new spiritual offerings like, in this case, the Enneagram, in order to decide whether they should be embraced, marginally incorporated into, or outright rejected by the church. In Matthew 28, 18, and 19, before his ascension, Jesus met with the eleven and uh, said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So discipleship in the first century was a well-understood concept. They didn't need to create little programs, uh, nine discipleship lessons and so forth. It was, in fact, a lifelong process the apostles had observed from their earliest childhood and had done themselves. Roughly three years before this meeting, recorded in Matthew 28, this small band had been called to be his disciples. They observed and imitated what their discipler, Jesus, did. In truth, all of us are already discipling and being discipled. We don't always recognize that, but uh, we are doing it well or we are doing it badly, but we are all doing it. In its simplest form, discipleship is observation and imitation. Those around you are watching what you're doing and they're imitating what you're doing uh, for good or for bad but they are being discipled by you in how you handle yourself around them. In 1967, uh, a public service announcement for the Stop Smoking campaign began airing on televisions across the nation. I was still in the days of a misspent youth when this came along, but it was somewhat interesting. It was titled, Like Father, Like Son. In a minute and two seconds, the father uh, is shown painting his house and the son observing and imitating. The father was driving his car and the son observing and imitating. The father was washing his car, the son observing and imitating. And as you guessed, the son was doing all of these things and everything the father did, walking on a path, throwing a stone, and finally sitting at the base of a tree. While the father sat there, he reached in his pocket and he took out a pack of cigarettes and took a cigarette out, laid the pack next to him between him and his son, the son picks up the pack, looks at it, starts to look inside, and then the announcer uh, says, like father, like son, think about it. That's a powerful tool because what we do impacts what others begin to believe and start to imitate. The father is discipling the son. The son observes and imitates what he sees his father doing, whether they are good things or bad things. So, how we train our people, whether it's just one more mature believer training another believer who's younger, whether it's an elder or a pastor in a church, the everyone around them is observing what they're doing and imitating what they're doing. They take on somewhat the personality, behavior, and habits of those that they are watching. In 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, Paul, Timothy's father in the faith, writes this, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men 
who will be able to teach others also. Discipleship is a lifelong process. It is observation and imitation. We hear those who we are learning from. We put that into our behavior, our thinking, and we practice it and we pass that on to others who in turn pass that on to others. Like father, like son. Later in this letter to the young pastor, Timothy's father in the faith, Paul wrote this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Pastors and teachers have a particular task. It is centered on Christ and His Word, and it is to prevent the embracing of feel-good false teachers and myths they perpetrate. This is so important to Paul, he raised it in Acts 20, 28 and following with the Ephesian elders. He charged them to guard the flock. Against what? Against false teachers that will creep into the church and drag away sheep or those who would rise up from within the church and teach false doctrine. The number one task of a pastor and, and elders is to guard the flock, to make sure that the teaching that is coming from the pulpit and from within the congregation itself is biblically centered, is Christ-centered. Uh, it is scripture alone, God's word alone, that informs us on faith and practice. And once we forget that, and start adding to Scripture, as J.C. Riles uh, has pointed out, uh, our additions become more important to us than the Scripture we are charged to teach. Biola University's Chimes newspaper posted an article on Tuesday, February 22, 2022. The Enneagram can be a great discipleship tool is the title. Pastors, church leaders, parents, and students trust Biola and in turn trust the source for discipleship, which Biola recommended in the university's newspaper. The first few sentences are perhaps the most important. They write this, quote, Although it faces considerable amount of backlash, the Enneagram has managed to become a popular personality test within Christian circles. It has been used as a tool of self-awareness and reflection since the mid-1900s. Unlike most personality tests, the Enneagram focuses less on a person's external behaviors and more on their internal motivations, end quote. We should note four important claims being asserted in this paragraph and ask, are they true, are they false, and does it matter? First, the Enneagram is touted as, quote, a great discipleship tool. Second, it is admitted that, quote, it faces considerable amounts of backlash, end quote. Third, the claim is asserted, quote, it has been used as a tool of self-awareness and reflection since the mid-1900s. Fourth, the Enneagram focuses less on a person's external behaviors and more on their internal motivations, end quote. On the first claim, it does appear that within many churches, they have embraced the Enneagram in various aspects of church ministry. Churches are using it for a nine-week sermon series. Uh, they use it for membership groups. They use it for marriage groups and in other ways. Undoubtedly, it has become a popular discipleship tool. But is it a good or a bad discipleship tool? Is it leading you to Christ and your identity in Christ, or is it leading you somewhere else? Where is it directing a person's attention? What behaviors are being modeled? With its wide use in pulpits and various groups within the church, is it given the air of a being a Bible-based tool? And if not something directly uh, in Scripture, it seems to be thought of as being at least implied or not contrary to Scripture. That brings us to the second claim, which admits that the Enneagram is facing, quote, considerable amounts of backlash. That would be an understatement. It is true 
Uh, the authors link to a brief article by Joe Carter titled The Facts, What Christians Should Know About the Enneagram. Joe Carter's article gives a short overview of the history and origins of the Enneagram. In previous sessions, Dr. Ron Huggins, Marsha Montenegro, and others have addressed the Enneagram's origins and history in some depth. But few comments are helpful at this point. Despite unsubstantiated claims by some, the drawing itself, the Enneagram, the circle, and the three images within it, didn't exist before esoteric mystic G.I. Gurdjieff created it in the early 1900s. This has not been hidden, but is information freely available to those who do the research. This has never really been uh, hidden, and we'll see that that is the case. It's always been available to demonstrate that Gurdjieff is the inventor of the drawing, and uh, it has been then used by others to build other things into it. In 1944, Maurice Nicole wrote, Tonight we will begin to study the diagram called the Enneagram, or Nine Diagram. This Enneagram is peculiar to this teaching. It is found nowhere else. When it was first given by G.I. Gurdjieff, he observed that several things in the system could be found in other ancient systems of esoteric teaching, but not the Enneagram. In this connection, he said that although several things in the system could be traced in the fragments remaining to us of other systems, there was no proper organization or arrangement of them, and the dependence of one thing on another could not be seen. And that comes from Maurice Nicole, Psychology Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Ospinsky, uh, Vincent Stewart Publishers, London, 1952, page 39. The Enneagram is a 20th century invention by esoteric mystic George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. The purpose of the design was the search for cosmic spiritual enlightenment in the vein of other occultists and Eastern uh, mystics and gurus. Gurdjieff eclectically borrowed from different sources, cobbled together a belief system that he applied to his newly drawn figure. It was not used as a personality tool at all and wouldn't be on for another 55 or 60 years after he first uh, drew it. In 1954, Gurdjieff devotee Rodney Collins incorporated astrology into the symbol. So if you see one of his Enneagram designs in 1954, you will find it tied to astro the astrological charts. It didn't spark a lot of interest in the New Age and occult circles in this uh, Enneagram design, and so it didn't really go very far. The Enneagram Institute, which is a New Age organization, and people should understand that because their churches oftentimes are sending them to take uh, the test at the Enneagram Institute. It was founded by New Agers and is run by New Agers. Uh, they admit that what we're saying here is true. They write this on their webpage. Many early Enneagram enthusiasts have mistakenly attributed the system of the nine types to Gurdjieff or to the Sufis because of Gurdjieff's use of some Sufi techniques. This has led to the widespread and erroneous belief that the Enneagram system has been handed down from the Sufis or from some other ancient school as an ongoing, quote, oral tradition, end quote. While it is true that Ichazo drew on this knowledge, of a number of such traditions, the actual combination of these traditions connected with the Enneagram symbol is purely his creation. The Enneagram Institute goes on to point out that, quote, the traditional Enneagram only goes back to the 1960s when Echazo was first teaching it. Now, for those who don't know this name, it's a brand new name to them, uh, Oscar Echazo is the one referred to. He was a New Age occultist uh, and started a group in Eureka, Chile, called the Eureka School in 1968. He was part of the human potential movement, uh, and his whole goal was self-actualization, a godlike state of being. He wanted to become one, really, with the cosmos. One of his more famous disciples, Claudio Naranjo, said that Ichazo didn't really teach it, but dabbled with it just a bit. He experimented around with it a little. Uh, from there, the Enneagram Institute makes a false claim. 
Although the philosophy behind the Enneagram contains components from mystical Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Taoism, Buddhism, and ancient Greek philosophy, particularly Socrates, Plato, and the Neoplatonists, all traditions are stretched back into antiquity. This is false. Dr. Ron Huggins has demonstrated that there is no evidence to validate this assertion. However, even if the claim were valid, even if it was the case that it stretches back to these different mystical traditions, the question needs to be asked, why would a Christian, particularly a Christian leader, turn from Sola Scriptura to mystical Judaism, Islam, Taoism, Buddhism, and ancient Greek philosophy to gain a better understanding of who we are in Christ in order to deepen our relationship with the one true God? Why turn to mystics and occultists instead of the Word of God? I don't understand that. Why are they discipling their followers into occultism, mysticism, the human potential movement, and away from a biblical understanding of themselves and God? The third claim that, quote, it has been used as a tool of self-awareness and reflection since the mid-1900s is partially true. It has been used by mystics, occultists, psychic channelers, and so it is a partly true statement. They are in search of enlightenment and in many cases trying to become one with the cosmos, uh, and it wasn't used for personality classifications or explanations. New Age occultist Oscar Chazo's contribution to the Enneagram came from communication with spirit beings named Metatron. Metatron uh, originates from the uh, Jewish Kabbalah mysticism uh, and, and, quote, interior master, end quote, he referred to as the Green Ketub. Part of the training of the students at Chazo's Arika School was preparation for the students to make contact with these entities as they work to maximize their human potential and self-actualization. These spirit contacts are relatively well known. Again, this isn't uh, something that's been hidden from anybody. Uh, Tyler Huckabee's article, The Rise of the Enneagram, uh, quotes Christopher Huertz, who is the author of The Sacred Enneagram, as he speaks about one such encounter. Quote, he's talking about Echazo. He went into a sort of a seven-day divine coma, Huertz explains. It was essentially a hallucinogenic prayer. And he said that during these seven days, this angel came to him and exposed to Echazo 108 different, what he then called Enneagons. So this angel comes and gives him 108 Enneagons, or now what we call Enneagrams. And really... Just one of those 108 is the Enneagram of personality, end quote. The interviewer, Tyre Huckabee, noted, whether or not you track with the idea of Echazo having a divine revelation that led to the Enneagram of personality, the verifiable parts of his story actually do check out. So it's pretty well established that, uh, that Echazo was meeting with some sort of spirit beings. He was channeling those spirit beings and getting information which he then used in his school to teach his disciples. The typing system was not added until Oscar Chazo's disciple, Claudio Naranjo, arrived on the scene. Claudio Naranjo was one of the fathers of psychedelic spirituality, what we might call better spirituality through better drugs. Like Gurdjieff, Echazo, and others, he was in search of spiritual enlightenment and connection to the cosmos. Psychedelic drugs were his preferred path to that end. In a 2010 interview, which is online, you can watch it on the YouTube channels, uh, Claudio explained that he re received the specific types through automatic writing. Automatic writing is an occult practice where the channeler holds a writing instrument and another entity moves his hand to write the words. It is a step beyond the Ouija board and far faster in receiving information from spirits. Instead of having to go one letter at a time, your hand just moves and writes out entire sentences and paragraphs. Former New Ager and professional astrologer Marsha Montenegro points out that the personality descriptions in astrology are older and at least as accurate, if not more accurate, than the types Naranjo received by spirit channeling. So again, we have to ask the question, if this comes from a supernatural source that is other than God, is it something that should be brought into the church and used for discipling, training, doing sermons on, 
marital counseling and so forth, or is this something that should be treated in the same way we would treat astrology? So if you're going to use astrology, uh, uh, the Enneagram in your church, shouldn't you also consider using astrology as a way to understand your people? The specific types Naranjo received are the very ones being used by pastors in their pulpits today. Christians under their pastors and disciplers are also using them. Membership groups, marriage groups, and others are being guided by material derived from occultic sources and promoted by celebrity Christians like Andy Stanley, Russell Moore, and many other Christian publishers and authors. The fourth claim, the Enneagram focuses less on a person's external behaviors and more on their internal motivations is true, but little understood by most involved with the Enneagram. It's a dictionary problem. If we don't ask groups what they mean by the terms they're using, we might unwittingly embrace what they're teaching without realizing it, and it's maybe false. A few ask these claims mean and other terms like true self and false self. What is the true self? What is the false self? At this point, many involved in Enneagram often miss the history, the origins, and actual purpose and claim it is simply a psychological tool. The first problem is that the originators are clear that it is a spiritual tool. It is not a psychological tool. But we will touch on that in a moment. If the intent of the Enneagram is as a psychological tool, is it a valid psychological tool? Has it been tested and scientifically validated? The answer is, psychologist Jay Medenwald did a psychometric test, and after he performed it, he published his paper titled The Enneagram, Science, and Christianity, Part 1. In the general conclusion, he writes this, For those who have studied psychometrics, it is a no-brainer. The Enneagram simply cannot do all its proponents claim it can. Any scientist who studies personality would simply look at their reliability scores and conclude the test is not accurate enough to be helpful, and therefore they wouldn't use it because the potential for harm would be too high. From a scientific perspective, Enneagram as a psychological tool is not valid. It fails the test of reliability and is potentially harmful. Those who view it as a personality profiling system have glossed over what the Enneagram teachers Richard Rohr and his disciples, Suzanne Stabile, Ian Cron, and Christopher Huertz have taught. Yes, it is called the Enneagram of Personality, and they also then define what it is. We simply have to read the definition of the Enneagram masters, like Christopher Huertz, for example, who says this, type isn't a type of person, but a path to God. So it isn't about why you do what you do as a personality, your external behaviors. It's about finding which way you get to go and connect back to God. He continues, one of my teachers, Russ Hudson, who as it happens is a New Ager, says, type isn't a type of person, but a path to God. I believe it's sacred because as a map of our soul, it's a compassionate sketch of possibilities. The Enneagram is less about nine types of people and more about nine paths back to our true selves and nine paths to divine love. So there's our words again, true selves. What is your true self? In the Enneagram, you're not a sinner separated from God in need of salvation. Your true self has never been separated from God. The problem is you have created a false self that falsely believes you have been separated from God. Your, quote, internal motivations, end quote, are deceived by this false belief of being separated from God. The Enneagram exists to help you figure out which of the nine paths are possible for your true self to follow. And they take you to the realization that you are already and have always been with peace and, and had peace and harmony with God and abandon your false self. So you can abandon this idea that you're a sinner you can stop acting as though you are a sinner living in a fallen world and start embracing your true self, which is with God, has always been with God, has never been separated from God. You just have a false identity problem, as Dr. Ron Cherry, author of the Enneagram Theology Is It Christian, points out. You don't have a sin problem, you have a false identity problem. The Enneagram test is to discover how you have deceived yourself 
and your internal motivations so you can discover what path takes you back to the realization that you have never been separated from God. The reason is simple. The Enneagram, in the Enneagram, God is bigger than the creation, but God is in and through the creation. Like any Eastern metaphysical view, since God is in and through all creation, everything is already in God. You're in God, I am in God, and in fact, the table that I'm sitting at is in God. Everything is in God. God is in and through everything. Uh, the Enneagram teachers introduce another God, another Christ, another gospel, and another salvation. As Dr. Peter Jones would point out, there are two views of God at work here, oneism and twoism. And I tried to think of a way of describing it. You know, I use terms like Gnosticism, paganism, and then I came to see the term monism, but my wife, who's much more intelligent than I, said, why don't you just drop the M from monism, which means all is one, and everyone will understand, so I did. So we get the term oneism, but it actually reduces God to a piece of creation, if you see what I mean. He's the spirit within things. The other I call twoism, because as Paul says, and if Paul is true, then what is true about existence is that there is creation, and then there's the creator who is radically different than creation. The watchmaker is different from a watch, right? You don't confuse them. And this is the case. God and creation are distinct, which means there are two kinds of existence, not one. Hence the term, you've got it, twoism. Some haven't heard this, but it's a very important concept. Oneism describes the God of the Enneagram. In Oneism, God and the creation are one. They are not separate. God is the creation. In the Enneagram, the creation is the first incarnation of the cosmic Christ. Through the gospel, there is no separation between man and God due to sin, uh, and therefore salvation is not necessary. You don't need to be saved in the Enneagram, because you're not separate from God. You are already with God. You just forgot that you're with God. And so the Enneagram is the way to rediscover that. In twoism, God interacts with creation, but is separate from creation. The Son internally existed with the Father, but did not incarnate until he took on human nature as the miraculous conception and was born as the Messiah. In the Greek, the word is Christos. To live a perfect life and, and that we couldn't live, and he gave his life as a ransom for many, Matthew 10, 28 and Mark 10, 45. He provided the way to peace with God and the mending of separation between us and God. The division between us and God is so great, we cannot cross it. It isn't that we are have always been with God and forgot that. It is that we are separated from God. It says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. That means separated from God. Uh, and Christ came to, to bridge that separation and that those who believe on him and call on his name can be saved. You cannot do it any, any other way. J.C. Riles was correct. Whenever a man takes upon him to make additions to the scriptures, he is likely to end with valuing his own additions above scripture itself. The Apostle Paul's instructions to Titus regarding ordaining leaders is just as important today as it was in the first century. Quote, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Titus 1.9 He must know the word of God. Leaders in the church must know biblical teaching well enough to teach sound doctrine that comes from God's word. They use it to rebuke those who contradict it. Seeing times like this in the future, even the future of Timothy's day, what Paul wrote bears repeating, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 2 Timothy 4, 1-4. through 4. 
The charge extends to pastors, elders, disciplers, celebrity Christians, Bible colleges, and universities. I have to admit, as I read this, I'm uncertain which parts of this are so unclear that so many have wandered off into the myth of the Enneagram. Is the Enneagram true? Well, it's true that it exists. But what does it teach? What it teaches is false. It doesn't teach you how to get back to a true self. It teaches you that you're not a sinner. That is false, according to biblical teaching. It teaches you there's a different God and a different Christ and a different way of understanding salvation. The Enneagram should be discarded by any and all churches that are imbibing upon its heresies. And uh, we do ask you to consider that. Contact us, write to us, email us. We're fine with that. We want to answer any questions possible. Uh, it is true that many well-meaning people are involved in what is truly a radical teaching and uh, passing that on through their churches and congregations. Mm -hmm.